<sighs> okay, <laughs> today's sermon might be a long one. I'll just give you the heads up. But I think it'll be interesting. Uh, so I, I'm preaching on the topic of family planning and birth control. So I'll give you my opinions and views on these topics and um, hopefully you'll learn something and it'll spark some discussion probably. Um, but family planning and, and birth control. Let's just read Psalms uh, 128. We'll just read the whole psalm. It says here, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labour of thine hands, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. Now I just want to talk first of all about you know, the, the idea that children come from obedience to God. Um, as opposed to the principle of reaping and sowing. And somebody might go to a passage like this in Psalms 128 and see, hey, see, if, if you fear the Lord and you walk in His ways, you're going to be blessed and God's going to bless you with children. Now, I think this is a dangerous thought because what people think then is, well, if I'm not having children, is it because I'm cursed by God? You know, am I not under the blessings of God? Because the natural question is, well, if I have to be obedient in order to get the blessing of God and have the blessing that God will give me children, well, how obedient do I need to be? You know, like, you know, do I have to be 100% obedient? Otherwise, I'm going to be under the curse of God. So I, I think this passage is not meant to be taken in this way because we're no longer under the old covenant. Um, and then you sort of ask the question, well, what about all the ungodly and wicked people that don't even care about fearing the Lord and they're still having children? So when somebody has this idea that you're blessed by your obedience and therefore God will bless you with children, has these questions that they can't answer. You know, how obedient do you need to be? What about un the ungodly? Um, so I don't think this is how this verse is meant to be interpreted. Uh, I think it's interpreted in light of the Old Covenant, where the Old Covenant was a covenant of works. Um, and if somebody did keep the works, they would be blessed. But now in the New Covenant, we are blessed by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there is a spiritual application to this, I believe. The spiritual application would be winning souls. You know, if you fear the Lord and you're preaching the word, you'll have spiritual fruit, even though you may not have the physical fruit of having physical children. Um, you know, and then you've got to ask the question, what about babies that are born via perverted methods like IVF? And I'll go into that as well in this sermon. You know, where, where God gives those babies life too. And they're like totally perverting God's design and perverting nature. Um, but yet children are still being born from that. So I think there's a spiritual application we can take from this in terms of winning souls. Um, you know, and I don't think it's something to do with our obedience because we, anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ has those blessings of God. But I think under the new covenant, it's more an issue of uh, reaping and sowing, in my opinion. Um, so let's go to Galatians 6, 7. We see this principle here. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So we're given this principle in the New Testament that if you sow something, if you, if you invest in something or you do some work into something, you'll reap the rewards of that work. Um, I want to show you here in uh, Hebrews... Six, seven. I didn't realize it was actually the same number uh, reference. I don't know if that really has any significance or not. I'm not really big on the numbers. But, you know, Galatians 6, 7 says, you know, whatsoever man saw, that shall he also reap. And it made me think of this verse in Hebrews 6, 7, uh, where it says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So what is that verse saying? It's saying that the blessing of God is the rain that comes on the earth, right? So the rain rains on, on all the earth. But it says here that the earth bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed. So even though God rains the blessing down onto the land, it still requires a husbandman. It still requires somebody tending to the land, dressing the land, and then the land will bring forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed. So when I think of having children, because I, 
we, we know that it's not about a blessing and a curse because otherwise we'd all be under the curse and then if I'm under the curse, why am I having children? Like, why is God still blessing me with children? So I like to think of it more in terms of reaping and sowing where, you know, the more seed you sow, the more fruit you're going to reap. And, you know, God, in a sense, like he reigns on earth, all, all the earth, God allows everyone that blessing to be able to have children. It's just whoever's going to sow, they're going to reap uh, children. So that's how I like to think of, you know, why people have children and why they don't. Because, yes, there are many factors, and I'm going to go into these factors, but if you think of it like a garden, you know, yes, God's going to rain on your garden, but the more you tend to the garden, the more you sow seed in that garden, the more your garden is going to bring forth fruit. And also the quality of the fruit is going to change too, depending on what you feed the garden and what nutrients you put into the soil. So a husbandman in a vineyard must dress the garden to expect fruit, even though the source of life ultimately comes from God. So I think children can be a sign of obedience and a good marriage, but they're not necessarily a result of obedience. Meaning, you know, if you are obedient to God, you fear the Lord, you love your wife, your wife has reverence for her husband, you're going to have a good relationship. You're going to have a loving relationship. You're going to want to please one another. You're going to want to, you know, sleep with one another. Um, so I can see how that having children is a sign that you have a good relationship and you're fearing the Lord, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a result of that, meaning if you do not fear the Lord, you, you can't have children because obviously the natural result of sleeping with your wife and sowing that seed is going to be children. So this philosophy that we play no part in producing children is false. You know, obviously we do. You know, if you sleep together, you're going to have children. If you don't sleep together, you're not going to have children. Um, even if you know, we believe that God opens and closes the womb. Can God give children without lying together? You know, is God going to miraculously give a couple children if they never sleep together? I guess the only exception is, is Mary, right? She gave birth to the Lord Jesus. But every other example, and that was a miracle, and that was a sign that Jesus was the Messiah. Um, but every other situation, it requires people to sleep together. Otherwise, God will never give those people um, children even in the cases where the ladies were barren. So somebody might have the frame of mind, well, if God doesn't want me to have children, then he won't let me get pregnant. But that's not, that's not, that doesn't hold true, you know, because if you sleep together, you know, if you dress the land, you'll receive, you'll receive the blessing from God and, and it'll bring forth fruit. So does this take away from the fact that God opens and closes the womb? I'm not going to go to all those verses, but we know in the Bible that it's God's place to open and close the womb. He can allow somebody to get pregnant or he can stop them from getting pregnant. Well, I don't think it does. I, just because we have an element of responsibility doesn't take away from the fact that God is still in control of whether or not a person gets pregnant or not. Or not. And, and we can sort of liken it to the analogy of salvation, right? I mean, God gets all the glory for somebody that gets saved. I mean, he's the savior. He's the one saving them. But can anyone get saved if we don't preach the word? How shall they hear without a preacher? So in the same sense that we need to sow the seed of the word of God, and that is something that is required for somebody to get saved, God, that doesn't change the fact that God is the one saving them. So it's the same with children. Even though we sow the seed, you know, and we you know, have a relationship with our wife and sow the seed, that doesn't take away from the fact that God can still open and close the womb. Because if God has closed the womb, it doesn't matter how much seed you sow. The womb will not bring forth fruit. Um, but likewise, the only reason why a womb brings forth fruit is because it's open. And God allowed that to happen. But it requires seed to be sown. So it can still rightly be said that God saved them just as God opens and closes the womb. Um, and he, but yet we still have a part to play. So with that in mind, let's talk about five reasons why people um, can't have children. And I'll go over five, five factors. One is the frequency. You know, obviously, if somebody wants to have children, we already talked, if you're not sleeping with your spouse at all, then obviously you're never going to have children. Um, but also, if you're not sleeping with your spouse frequently enough, then you 
are severely reducing your chance of having children as well. And this is why starting young helps because when you know when you're younger, you maybe have more libido, you know, or at the beginning of your relationship, it's there's more that honeymoon period where you want to sleep with other with each other more often. So you'll sleep together more frequently, and it's not so much of a burden on you to sleep with your spouse. Um, Obviously, that's not an excuse as you move on into your relationship not to sleep with your spouse because we ought to love one another and that is one way that we show our love is we offer our bodies to our spouse. Now, I, I looked this up on the internet just to see, uh, you know, what is that window where a woman is actually pregnant? Uh, woman, what's the likelihood of a woman uh, getting pregnant and, and what's that period of time? Because we know that a, a, a woman is just not perpetually fertile because she ovulates and then that comes at a certain time and then obviously when she has her period and, and, and the menstrual cycle she's obviously not fertile there because the body's flushing the the um, egg out of her womb and I looked it up and and it said that there's basically a six-day window when a lady can get pregnant and the reason why it's a six-day window is because when the seed of a man goes into a woman, th that seed can last up to five days. So even, so, so you sleep together, up to five days later, you may still have live sperm within the lady that can fertilize an egg. Now, when a lady ovulates and the egg comes from her ovary, once it, it's coming down, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on how this all works, but supposedly it only lasts one day, like 24 hours is like the period when the, ov ov the egg comes out and it can be fertilized by the sperm that is there. So that's why there's a six day window because five days, let's say you slept together five days and then the ovary comes on the fifth day and then it's alive for one day. So supposedly there's this six day window of when she can get pregnant. Now think about this. If you're sleeping together once a week, you could just be totally missing that six day window every single time because you know you sleep together and then the six days pass, then all the, the seed has died, she, she, you know, she ovulates, and then you sleep together after the, over, over, uh, after the egg has died. So, so I would say that if you want to get pregnant, sleeping with your spouse once a week is too infrequent um, because of that six day window. So I guess scientifically, and this is just me theorizing, you know, if, you, if we think about giving birth, uh, getting pregnant with children like a garden, I mean, when the season is ready to sow the seed, and because and, even uh, when you plant crops, there's a certain season where you, you sow, and there's a certain season that it grows, and there's a certain season that you reap. You would think that in that six-day window, that's when you want to be sowing the seed, right? And if you sow the seed, you know, every day, whatever, multiple times a day, then you're going to have a higher chance of bringing forth fruit. So I would say that once a week might be too infrequent. Because let's say in that six-day window, even if you're sleeping together in that six-day window, you've only really got one opportunity for the seed to fertilize the egg. So I think if you have a biblical relationship with your spouse, you know, if you're following the principles that I preached about having a good marriage, this, sh this shouldn't really be an issue. You know, it's not an issue for couples that are sleeping together. But if, if it is an issue for your relationship, then you need to reflect on why your relationship is like that. Maybe, you know, you need to work on it and um, form a closer relationship with your spouse so that this is not really a struggle for you. It's just something that naturally happens. Okay, so that's one reason, is the frequency. If, if sleeping together is not frequent enough, you can't really expect to get pregnant because the more seed you sow, the more fruit you're going to bring forth. Number two would be medical issues. So let's say, for example, past mistakes with birth control pills. You know, women that have taken birth control in the past, you know, maybe they've done some hormonal damage to their body. They might have, you know, there's that uh, some birth control pills create a lining in the womb that actually doesn't allow the fertilized egg to implant, um, might actually kill a fertilized egg, cause a silent abortion. And that lining might still be there. It might take many months, many years for your body to get rid of that, uh, those toxins out of your body that are actually causing you to miscarriage. So there could be past mistakes that people have done with medications and things like that not to get pregnant and that stuff is still in their body or it's messed up their body in a way where they're not uh, ovulating how they should and, and, and the body isn't able to keep that fertilized egg. Um, 
What about people that have had past abortion procedures? You know, maybe they've had an abortion in the past, they've made that mistake, but, and, and again, maybe now their body is not operating the way it should. You know, maybe you're on medications, you know, medications that are making your body not operate the way it should, um, or past operations and surgeries where maybe your body is investing resources into fixing those things and it's not allowing you to carry a child to full term. So there could be medical issues. So frequency, medical issues. Um, number three could be health issues. You know, it could be that a, a lady is overweight. You know, she's, she's, she's overweight and sometimes it's harder to get pregnant if you're not in optimum health. Maybe you're underweight. Um, maybe you're not taking care of your diet. Maybe your diet is too devoid of nutrition that the body is not allowing you to get pregnant because it doesn't have the nutrition uh, to keep that baby alive, keep it in your system. Um, you know, it could be stress. You know, stress might cause somebody uh, difficulty in getting pregnant. Uh, you know, somebody might have a cancer where it's not allowing the body to operate the way it should. Uh, and we already talked about past operations or other medical conditions that might prevent the body from being able to get pregnant. So frequency, medical issues, medical issues, health issues. Age is a factor as well. You know, the older you get, you're, you're, you're less fertile. It's just a known, I guess, a known uh, theory in the, in the scientific world of all the studies that they do and they look at the age and when people are more fertile, even, I'll be talking about IVF in a second, but even in IVF, the chances of a woman having a successful IVF procedure is much, much greater when she's under 30, you know, than when she's over 30. So age plays a part as well. And this is a, one reason why you want to have children when you're younger, because as you get older, it's going to be much more difficult to get pregnant than it is when you're uh, under 30. Um, and obviously when you hit menopause, then, then that's, that's your season is over when that happens. Now, the last factor, so we've got frequency, medical issues, health issues, age. Now, the last factor, like I said, could be God. Because it doesn't rule out the fact that God can open and close the womb. So, well, one thing you want to think about here is, if you want to be more sure that it's God, that God is the reason why you're unable to get pregnant, is you want to eliminate all the other factors. You know, because if you know you're not taking care of your health, you can't really just say, well, God, you know, let's say somebody, you know, is taking drugs or something and they're not getting pregnant. Then obviously you can't just blame God for, for why you're miscarrying or why you're, you can't give birth. Or let, let's say somebody's overweight or underweight or not eating right. I mean, can they, can they in good conscience say, well, it's all God. And I know it's God that's not letting me have a child. It could be. It might not be. But if you eliminate that factor and you start striving to have good health, start striving to have your body in a, a way where you can eliminate the other four factors, hey, it could be God. And maybe it's just not the right timing for you to have a baby. And in God's time, He will allow uh, your womb to bring forth a child. And you just have to have faith that His timing is right. So those are five reasons why people can't have children. So you, in your own life, you might want to think about those different reasons and try and eliminate the first four um, so that you can wait on God's timing. Now, what do people do when they don't want to wait on God's timing? So I'll just touch a bit on my thoughts and opinions on what people call assisted reproductive technologies. So you'll see ARTs, and that stands for assisted reproductive technologies. And that's where you've got the artificial insemination, IVF, surrogacy, and things like that. Now, I wouldn't really call them assisted reproductive technologies. It's, it's more like perverted conception technologies because that's all it's about. It's just perverted ways in order to get a baby conceived and then implanted into a mother's womb. Now, and you ask me, you know, what's my position on assisted reproductive technologies? I'm against all of them. Um, and I'll, ex I'll go through them one at a time and just explain how they work and why I believe that they are wrong to do. So I'm against all of them. You know, one reason why I'm against all of them is because it commoditizes children. It like commoditizes them and it dehuma dehumanizes children. Because children, children are not a commodity just to be bought and sold. It's not like, oh, I feel like having children, so I'm just going to pay $20,000 and get one. You know? So, you know, we, we don't want to reduce people and children to the level of animals. 
You know, animals, you, you want to buy a chicken, you go buy a chicken. You want to buy a cow, you go buy a cow. You know, but we ought not to be treating human life like that. We don't treat humans and just buy and sell them like cattle. Um, and this is sometimes what assisted reproductive technologies do because, hey, when it's convenient for that person, when they feel like having children, when they want one, and then, you know, when you have that mentality, then they start choosing which ones they want and DNA selection, and, and it just becomes more of a commodity than it does about bringing a new soul into the world. Um, you know, I know, and I know, obviously, having children, it's a sensitive topic, you know, because people that can't have children, I realize they really want children, so they, they go down these, these pathways. So I'm not being... Uh, I'm not having a lack of compassion and I know it's difficult for people who really want children and why, you know, the motive behind why they go down these methods. So I'm not saying that everyone that does uh, assisted reproductive technologies is just treating um, people, uh, treating humans like commodities, but that is what it does. That is what it does even though that's not the intention for why they are doing it. Um, so I know it's a sensitive topic but, you know, at the end of the day, like, your emotions don't change morality. You know, just because somebody's upset by something, that doesn't change the truth. But, you know, I'm not angry at those people who've used these methods either, but I just want them to realize um, why they are wrong. So let's just talk about the first one. The first one is artificial insemination. So what is artificial insemination? Artificial insemination is, is instead of seed being sown in a woman naturally, through the natural act between a man and a woman, you're getting seed externally, which, which is already questionable, right? Because how are you getting that seed externally? You know, usually a guy will have to sit in a room you know, by himself and watch some pornography or something like that and then harvest that seed in order for them to even use it. So that's, that's already questionable, you know, what a man has to do in order to donate seed to a sperm bank. Um, so that's already one perversion of how God meant it. So, but artificial insemination is basically you're getting this seed and then artificially putting it into a lady in order for her to get pregnant. Now, number one is there's no reason why a couple who are married should ever use artificial insemination. You know, because if, if a man's going to watch pornography in order to get seen and artificially inserted into his wife, why don't they just have a normal relationship and just insert it naturally? Um, so there's a perversion there in the sense that if a, if a married couple actually used artificial insemination, then they're going against God's design in how to actually create children. Because it, it takes away the need to have a relationship with your wife. It takes away the need to have a stable and committed relationship. They don't even have to sleep with one another, and yet they can still have babies. And I think the reason why that's a bad idea is because God has designed children as a reward of marriage for a reason. Because that means that children are created out of love, rather just out of selfishness. It means that children are created in a stable and loving relationship as opposed to just created because um, you know, of selfishness and people wanting, wanting children rather than having that healthy, loving relationship. Now, that's if a married couple does it. Now, if an unmarried couple does it, meaning, you know, let's say uh, the man for some reason has been uh, given the, the belief that he's infertile or, and, 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 and he can't use his seed, so then what somebody might do is get somebody else's seed from a sperm bank, artificially inseminate it into their wife, and then have that baby. And I just kind of think, well, who are they kidding? Like, who are they, like, if I get somebody else's seed, put it into a lizard and have a baby, well, am I kidding myself that that's my baby? You know, I just like got somebody else's seed and, and created a baby from it. Um, I'm no longer the father. So there's a problem there that now the, the parents are not the actual biological parents of the child. And you've actually robbed that child of their real father, which is the person that watched the pornography and donated the sperm to the sperm bank. So I can't see, I can't see a way where artificial insemination is ever right. Unless, you know, I, I wouldn't rule out the fact, you know, maybe if, you know, maybe a man doesn't have his, his privy member anymore. You know, that, that could be uh, where maybe this, I don't even know if you can harvest sperm from a man, like you can harvest eggs from a lady. But, you know, maybe that would be the only reason I would accept, hey, well, if, he, if they cannot physically sleep together, then maybe artificial insemination is, is permissible. Um, 
So that's artificial insemination. You know, I would say that I'm against it 99% of the time. Um, now what about in vitro fertilization as opposed to in utero fertilization? So in vitro fertilization, if you don't know how that works, the way it works is you'll pay some crazy amount of money to even get this done. I think, I think in Australia it costs around $12,000 just to do one cycle of IVF. And the way IVF works is a woman will take a hormone that basically overstimulates her ovaries and then the ovaries, instead of just producing one egg, the ovary will produce multiple eggs. And this is different for different ladies. And even the quality of the egg drops because you, you, a lady may um, create 20 eggs but there may be like 15 of them are mature and can be used for fertilization. So she might just create five dud eggs as well. So they give this lady this hormone, she produces all these eggs. Then, um, you know, and then you got to ask the question of the potential side effects of the hormones. You know, is it even healthy for the lady to do that, to overstimulate um, her ovaries? Sometimes ovaries are, are over, overstimulated and they have to figure out a way to actually heal that ovary again because it, it's like it went into overdrive. Um, and then you've got the quality of the eggs produced as well, which might not be so much of a big deal because, you know, you haven't fertilized these eggs yet. So only some of those eggs um, might be able to be used. And then the second step is that those eggs are then surgically retrieved from the woman's ovaries. So she'll go under surgery, they'll try and extract those ovaries, uh, those eggs from her ovaries. And you know, elective surgery is never ideal. So when you, when you just do a surgery that's just, you don't really have to do it, it's just elective, that's never an ideal situation because you still have to take all the anesthetics and uh, uh, heal through that process and everything like that. Now once they get those eggs, they figure out which eggs are the mature eggs that can be fertilized and then they fertilize them in vitro. So in vitro means outside of the normal environment. So either in a test tube or in a petri dish um, in some sort of fluid. So they'll put these eggs and they'll fertilize them with the seed of a man. And they might do that naturally. So they might in the petri dish just put the seed of the man in the petri dish and the, and the, the seed will naturally fertilize those eggs. But to be more sure what they do is something called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is when they use a syringe and they, they, they actually artificially insert a sperm into each of those eggs using a syringe, just to make sure that those eggs are fertilized. Probably because sperm are not designed to swim in a petri dish. You, know, you kind of think like, well, why do they need to do these processes? It's because you take, you're taking the egg out of the lady, then you're taking the sperm out of the man into a glass dish, and then you gotta force them to fertilize because it's not normal. Um, and then the eggs that are developing well are either transferred or frozen. So then they, they fertilize them and because you're outside of the normal process, the, the, these eggs, they don't, they don't, these fertilized babies, they don't develop as normal. They start being mutilated, they start fragmenting. But of the ones that are healthy, that do uh, develop normally, they will then transfer those to the mother or they will keep them on ice and freeze them, um, like you see in a sci-fi movie. So what are the issues with IVF? What are, what are my issues with IVF? I've got a couple of reasons here. So number one is IVF conceives children that have no chance of survival. That's just a fact. When you do IVF, you will conceive children that cannot survive. And the reason why they cannot survive is, like I said, because you've taken them out of the womb You've, t you've, you've put them in, a, in, in a, an, a laboratory, in a dish, expect them to fertilize. It's like, it's like giving birth to a baby and leaving them out in the cold, and if they survive out there for nine months, then, then you'll adopt them and take them in. And, you know. So you're sort of like taking these children out of their normal hab habitat, putting them into this really bad environment which they are not meant to be in. And the process guarantees that there will be children conceived that will not make it. And I'll just show you a couple of, couple of pictures from this website. Because this is how they sort of like judge whether or not, you know, a, um, an embryo, they call it, we'll call it a baby, is worth trans transferring into a mother. So that's one that is developing well, uh, I think, on the third day. But because they're doing this in vitro, sometimes you get babies that conceive like this. Like they're all like mutated, they're not developing healthily or they're fragmented, you know, and then they grade these 
these babies different ways and only if it becomes like a certain grade will they then implant it into a mother. Because, you know, God forbid you'd have a baby that's disabled. So, you know, but when, see, when you, when you conceive naturally though, there's always a chance that that baby will survive, right? And even if, even if that baby is disabled, some people still take that pregnancy all the way to birth because, you know, they value life. But my point is, you know, when you, when you sleep with a person, when you sleep with your spouse and she conceives, there's always a chance that that baby will go through and, and be born. But when you decide to go down the IVF path, there's not even that chance that, hey, all these babies are going to survive. No, babies will die in the process. There, there will be deaths because the success rate of IVF is not 100%. And it's actually very low, and I'll go into that in a moment, which means that it's, there's a very high chance, or well, 100%, that many, many babies will die. So the success, rate, the success rate of IVF can be measured several ways. Like if, we, if you go to the website like here, like IVF Australia, the success rate, sometimes they measure th the success rate of IVF. Um, you see the, the dark purple there is clinical pregnancies at embryo transfer. So sometimes they'll say an IVF is successful when we transfer the developing embryo to the lady and it implants. She gets a big, they call it a BFP, a big fat positive, when you take the pregnancy test and you get the two lines. Um, but because it wasn't transferred normally, like, like two people sleeping together, sometimes those eggs don't survive. So there's, an, there's another way that they measure the success of IVF, which is live births, which means of all, you know, of all the people that go through IVF, how many actually end up with a live baby? So you can see that there's a difference here of about 5 to 10% of how many women actually get pregnant using IVF and how many actually give birth to a baby. So depending on what rate they use, it can be a higher or lower number. Now, the live birth rate, so you can see here, if you're using the live birth rate, for women under 30, in, from this website, IVF Australia, it's about 40%. So 40% of women will end, who do IVF, who are under 30, end up with a baby at the end of it. Now, I, I didn't look into this, but I really wonder, how, how many ladies even under 30 do IVF? Do you know? Because I think, you know, if, if most people do IVF when they're older, because, you know, when they're younger, they're like, well, I've still got time. They just keep sleeping with their spouse. They don't get pregnant. Then when they're over 30, then they start thinking, well, I'm not getting pregnant. I might go do IVF or do something like this. So I wonder, even though this percentage is high, you think, oh, you look at that graph, you think, oh, more women under 30 are actually doing it. But it could be, if you look at the total number of women doing IVF, it could be the other way around. I'm not sure, but don't take my word for that. The other thing this graph doesn't show is how many eggs are harvested. Because there's several factors that determine the success of IVF. It's the age of the woman, but there's also the number of eggs that are harvested from the lady. Because obviously the more eggs that are harvested, the more eggs can get fertilized, the more eggs can be transferred, and the higher chance you'll have a baby at the end of it. Now, because we have a problem with this, because if we believe a baby exists at, at the point of conception, this graph doesn't tell you how many babies are being conceived and being discarded of, being discarded. So when you look here, let me show you this graph from another place. This is one from a fertility clinic, and this is their numbers. You know, they're trying to say, oh, you know, look, the average is 40%, but our clinic is 58%. Because obviously they screen people and things like that. You know, like, it's like when you go to do any surgery, they'll screen you and if, if, if you're not a fit, they, they won't do it because they don't want to affect their success rate. Because um, it looks better, obviously. They can say, hey, out of all the surgeries that we've done, we've had this much success because they've screened the ones that they know uh, it's not going to work on. That could be one reason, obviously, because they want it to work for the person as well, so not discounting that. But this graph actually shows the success of IVF in this clinic compared to the number of eggs retrie uh, retrieved. And each of these lines is now the different age brackets. So the, the blue line is less than 35 years, and then you've got 35 to 37, 38 to 40, and then 41 to 42. So you can see as the age of a woman decreases, uh, increases, 
the probability of IVF being successful decreases dramatically. Um, but also the number of eggs that is retrieved from a woman, as that increases, it increases her chance of getting pregnant. So it's saying here that if we can retrieve more than 10 eggs in a woman that is less than 35, we have a 65% success rate of, of attaining a child. So this is why I say there's a problem with IVF because that's not 100%. Like none of these are 100%. That means when you go through with this procedure, you go in knowing that there are going to be fertilized eggs, there's going to be babies that are conceived, and they will die. They will not survive. And this 65% is for women under 35. I mean, how many women even do that? And this is for eggs more than 10. And I mean, so that's, 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 that's just one, because some ladies, they, they retrieve like 20, 30 eggs. And they might be like 25 mature, all of them fertilized. 25 fertilized, and they end up with one baby. So how many babies had to die in order for them to go through this procedure and have one baby? And I was looking up at some forums. Let me show you some of the numbers. This is some forums of women talking about their IVF experiences. Look at this, look at this lady. IVF number one, six retrieved, four fertilized, three abnormal, one stopped growing. So that's four babies dead right there. IVF number two, five retrieved, three fertilized and frozen. So I guess what they're saying there is three were successful and then they put them on ice to maybe transfer all at one time so they have a higher chance of getting pregnant. IVF number three. And, and remember, this, this is like tens of thousands of dollars each time. You know? so it's not cheap. That's why they have to try and get as many eggs as possible because it's expensive. You know? So they're trying to do it all in one go. IVF number three, 16 retrieved, 14 fertilized. That's 14 babies created. Only eight made it to day five. Total of 11, so that's the eight plus the, th uh, the three that were fertilized here. Total of 11 sent for genetic testing. Three with fragile, one with Down syndrome. Four perfect, four inconclusive. So that means after all this, she ended up with four that were transferable. But how many were fertilized? Four, three, 14, 21 babies were created and she ended up with four of them. And, and that's not even saying yet like whether those four were successful. So if she ends up with one baby, that means 21 babies were conceived and 20 died in order for her to have one baby. So can you see the problem with IVF? Because you're going into it, you know, it, you're going into it knowing that, um, that babies are going to die. And when you see the success rate, it never talks about the number of babies that are conceived. Like I had, I had to dig through trying to find these numbers because it's, and you, you, can't, you can't have to work it out yourself because it doesn't talk about how many babies are conceived. It just talks about how many people ended up with a baby. But how many, how many eggs did they have to conceive and how many children had to die in order for them to have that baby? Now, the objection to this might be, and, and you know, I read through this forum and it, you know, the numbers sometimes are just mind-boggling of how many babies are being fertilized and they're just talking about it like normal. But Somebody might say, well, how is it different to a miscarriage? You know, because somebody who's miscarrying several times, you know, they might say, you know, because, well, if God wanted that baby to survive, he'll, he'll make it survive, just like in the womb. If God wanted that baby to survive, then that baby would go through to birth. And if you miscarriage, if you've done everything you can, then, you know, it's, that's not your fault. All IVF is doing is it's just doing it multiple times. You know, and if God wants that baby to survive, then it will survive. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. I don't know whether you can say that because, you know, number one, you know, if, if, you're, if you're fertilizing 20 eggs, you're not, gonna, you're not trying to give birth to 20 babies. You're just trying to get one. Somebody might say, well, I'm keeping the rest on ice because I'm going to have them later. Well, the chances are they're not going to survive in the ice. You know, because even after they dethaw those eggs, it doesn't mean that that's going to bring forth a bring forth a baby in the womb, even though that baby's already been created. But, you know, as I explained before, you know, we do make a difference. Remember I talked about the different factors of why different people give, may, may be able to get pregnant and may not be able to. So your health is a reason why. Like you can actually affect the health of a baby growing in your body. So I, I, you know, people say, how is this different to a miscarriage? Well, number one, if you take a baby out of the normal process, 
out of the womb and try and give birth to it or conceive it in a petri dish, how can you say that that's leaving it to God? How can you say that that's the same? Like people are trying to say, well, they, they, they conceive these babies in a petri dish in womb-like conditions. And then if it's the same, then it's just up to God, right? God is the one that didn't allow them to survive. Are you kidding me? Like you, you, cannot, you cannot convince me that conceiving a child in a glass dish in fluid is the same as conceiving a child in a human body. I mean, scientists don't know what's going on. They don't know all the different systems that are going on and all the, the hormones and all the enzymes, whatever's going on to conceive and keep this child alive. Uh, you, you, take, you take it out of that environment and then you're going to claim that it's the same as God and then therefore it's the same as a miscarriage? I don't think so. You know, that, 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 that you, are, you are taking what is natural, you're taking what is normal, you're stripping of, of all that, putting it in an environment that it's not meant to be, it dies, it mutates, it deforms, and then you're, you're going to say that's the same as a miscarriage of like a normal pregnancy? It, it, you'd be hard pressed to convince me of that. Um, because scientists, they don't know what's going on inside a womb. Um, you know, you think about... Um, so, so that's one reason. One reason why it's not like a miscarriage um, is because it's not exactly the same. The second reason why it's not like a miscarriage is because when you have a miscarriage, you're losing one baby. But when you do IVF, you're losing 15 babies in one go. Like how many people miscarriage 15 times in one year? You can't even do that. Whereas if you do IVF cycles and you're killing mass numbers of babies, every time you do it. And you know, a miscarriage, when you have a miscarriage, this is not something that women pursue. You know, it's not like I'm going to get pregnant so I can have a miscarriage and I'm going to get pregnant another 14 times and have 15 miscarriages. Like that's not the mentality that you have when you try and get pregnant. Every pregnancy, you're trying to preserve the life of this baby. But when you go into IVF, you go into it knowing that 15 babies are going to die or knowing that multiple mass amounts of babies are going to die. That's a very, very different mentality than doing one baby at a time, trying to keep that baby alive. It's almost like you think, well, I don't, I'm, I'm going to strive for 15 miscarriages. As long as I get one, it doesn't bother me. So it's, it's a very, very different view on the value of life. And you know, so you can miscarriage for reasons that are your own fault, but IVF is like doing this en masse um, with the goal of only the strongest surviving. Now, the last reason why it's not like a miscarriage is because, you know, these babies that don't develop properly, remember I showed you those images, they're just discarded. You know, the ones that don't develop properly, the ones that might have disabilities, the might, ones that might have a bit of abnormality, they're just thrown, thrown away, just thrown down the toilet like human waste. Whereas if you get pregnant and you find out your baby has a disability, some people keep that baby. And they go through to pregnancy and they keep that baby alive. Whereas IVF, no, it's only survival of the fittest. Only the baby that's perfect genetically. It's like the old Greeks, right? I remember in 300, they like look at the baby and it's like if it's not like, well, they just like throw it into the chasm. You know what I mean? So it's, it, that's what it's like with IVF. You're just like looking at, into this petri dish and the ones that, that, um, that form well, they're the ones that are kept, but the rest are just thrown away like garbage. So I believe IVF, it, it's, it's not good. It's very wicked. And, um, you know, people that do it, you know, I don't doubt their intentions. I don't doubt their motives. You know, they love children. They want to have a child. But I don't think they realize what actually has to happen in order for them to get that child. And if they realized what happened, maybe they wouldn't do it anymore. You know, because they, if they realized they were creating life that could not survive, you know, is that worth it for them just to have one baby? No, you're looking at your baby and it's like you were the, just the fittest out of 20 that survived. Um, it might make people look at it differently. All right, I spent a lot of time on that one. So artificial insemination, IVF. Um, I might just cover the other two and talk about the last topic another week. But the other two is surrogacy. Now, and I'm against surrogacy as well. Now, there's two types of surrogacy. One is full or straight surrogacy, which is when you artificially inseminate a woman and you use her egg. So it's like, it's like artificial insemination into a woman that's not your wife and then she's going to bring up that baby and give birth to it and then you're basically going to take that baby from her and then raise it with another lady. 
Now, I probably don't have to explain to you why that's wrong, but you know, let's just explain why it's wrong. You know, number one, you're denying children of their biological parents, again, like with artificial insemination. Because, like again, who, who are you kidding? I mean, if you artificially inseminate another woman, you use her egg, and then you pretend that your wife is actually the mother of that child. I mean, that's not the case. I mean, that lady is the mother of that child. And you can read articles where women who have done surrogacy, they regret going through surrogacy. Because that's a natural part of giving birth, is that you, you form a relationship with that baby. Like mothers form a relationship with the baby that's in their stomach because they feel the kicks. They, ha they get an idea of the personality of that baby. And they start looking forward to seeing that baby. Then they have to go through the birth and the labor and the work to give birth to that baby, only then to give that baby away. And you wonder why they, they regret going through it? I mean, nine months is a long time. You know, to, to, to know somebody in your womb just to, to see them and then not even be able to continue the relationship from that. So you're denying children of their biological parents and it's planned adoption. You know, adoption is not an ideal situation where you, you create a child and then adopt them to parents that are not their biological father and mother. But that's what surrogacy does. You're like, pl you're like planning the adoption for the children where you're creating them knowing that you're going to adopt them and putting them into that less than ideal situation. And you know, this is why same-sex parenting, like homosexuals that want to be parents, you know, who are they kidding? You know, they're not the parents. You know, like Penny Wong is one of the, the, the members of parliament. And you know, she has a child. But who is she kidding? You know, maybe one of the ladies, if they use their egg first of all, is the mother of that child. But they can't, they're not both the mothers. Who are they kidding? You know, you're not fooling me. You're not fooling anybody. You know, people are just accepting what Penny Wong says because they're too politically correct to say, no, you're not the mother. You know, one of you is the mother and you've taken some sperm from some other guy and he's the real father. And that's the only reason why you have this child. Um, so homosexual parenting, homosexuals that parent, you know, they inherently strip children of their biological father and mother. So it's a very self, you know, they, they claim that they love children. Well, why don't they protect the right of children to their biological mother and father? That's not very fair to, to, to change the natural order of things. You don't even give the child a choice of whether or not they want to be with their biological father and mother. You just force them into an adopted relationship. Um, so that's the problems with full or straight surrogacy. Obviously, if you're using the egg of another woman, that woman is not the mother of that child. But the other type of surrogacy is called just, uh, I don't know if it's gestational, just gestational surrogacy? Is it, is it g or is it j? G? Yeah. G. Gestational surrogacy. So gestational surrogacy requires IVF. So the difference between full and straight surrogacy is you're, you, you're just artificially inseminating into another lady. Gestational surrogacy is when you use IVF a, in order to get a woman pregnant and she has no relationship to the baby besides the fact that she uh, you know, carries the baby for nine months and gives birth to that baby. Now, all these things you can see, it's a perversion of God's design. There's a reason why God designed, you know, a married couple to sleep together and have children. There's a beauty about it. You know, you know that children that are conceived that way, they're conceived in love. They're not conceived in a laboratory to the highest bidder. Um, you know, so... God has designed it this way because it creates stability. It creates this loving environment. This is how God has planned it. And when we use all these other methods, it's really perverting God's design for women. And, and even when it comes to surrogacy, it's perverting the design of a woman having that relationship with her child. You know, carrying the baby, seeing it through to the birth, and already having that intimate relationship once the baby has been born. You know, it reminds me of Pharaoh's daughter, you know, with Moses in the river, you know. Um, and you know the story in Exodus where, you know, Moses, uh, Pharaoh's daughter goes down to the river and finds Moses and then uh, Moses' sister comes and says, hey, do you want me to find a, a woman to nurse the child for you? And then she goes and gets Moses' mother. And what's Pharaoh's daughter's attitude? Yeah, did go take this child away and nurse it for me and I'll, and I'll give you your wages. And this is what women are like, some women are like these days. You know, they, they don't want to go through the trouble of having a good relationship with their husband, go through the trouble of you know, conceiving naturally and, and doing all those things. They just want to pay somebody and then claim the child as their own. And, and this is a very ungodly attitude that is permeating our society. 
And I hope today, just as you learn a bit about what the world does with IVF and assisted reproductive technologies, it'll change your perspective on whether or not we should be supporting them or not. And you know, I'm not saying to be hard on people that do them, but you know, let's say you come across somebody that's thinking about it. You know, if you know about these things, you can educate them and say, hey, you know, maybe this is not the best thing to do. And especially if they're a Christian, you know, do they know that they're going to be conceiving multiple children and some of them are just going to be thrown down the trash because they're not going to survive the IVF um, procedure. Now, I hope you learned something today. I think I'll end it there because if I go on to my next point, it's going to be like another 45 minutes. So maybe I'll just leave that for the next sermon. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that gave you some things to think about. And if you have any questions about it, you can ask me afterwards. Let's uh, sing one more song.